Hello, let's recap week number nine of dynamics. We're progressing fast indeed, Christmas is almost on the radar. What we discussed last time was inertial forces. We talked about moving and rotating frames and how in those frames inertial forces appear. These Coriolis, Euler, centrifugal forces, and they give rise to, give rise to interesting dynamics. What we discussed this week is that we also see torques being produced by these forces. And so, because of that, we also need to talk about angular momentum balance in a rotating or moving frame. And that's exactly what we discussed here. So, this week's topic is A and B in a moving, and for us that usually means a rotating frame. And the main equation is pretty much the same as before, namely the net torque with respect to a certain point equals the rate of change of angular momentum plus potentially extra terms. We made one simplification here that we want to stick to, which is we always choose as the reference point B the center of mass or a fixed point. That's what we would like to choose because this simplifies things a bit. So if this is the case, then angular momentum balance reads how? The net torque, M, with respect to point B, equals what we've seen before is IB times omega. And these extra terms disappear because of that assumption. Now the catch is because we're in a moving frame, I need to differentiate it with respect to time, so D by DT. But in a rotating frame, this becomes the derivative seen by the rotating frame plus omega m, the angular velocity of the rotating frame cross, and in this case, this would again be ib times omega. And this is angular momentum balance. And this over here is nothing else but the angular velocity of the rotating frame. So if you pick a reference frame where your coordinates, you know, e1m, e2m, and 3m, uh, e3m, moving, this is the angular velocity of that frame. Now, we discussed one uh, important case, namely we have one special frame. The M frame is a moving one, we have one special one that we highlighted. This is what we call the body frame. And we called it M hat, because it's a special one. And this is the frame which satisfies two conditions. First of all, it rotates with the body of interest, meaning that the angular velocity of the frame is the same as the angular velocity of the body that we're considering. And in this case, these two guys will be the same, just simplifying things. And the second condition, and this is important, is that and this m hat is a principal frame. Remember, Every frame had a particular moment of inertia tensor. It looked different in all kinds of frames, but if we were in a principal frame, meaning our axes align with the principal symmetry axis of the body, then our IB, moment of inertia tensor, became diagonal. And that's what we want to explore here. So we want to seek a principal frame in which IB is diagonal, and we make sure that we rotate with the body. And if these two conditions are satisfied, then in the body frame, we derive what we know as the Euler equations. And what are these Euler equations? Well, I'm just going to write them down. They look like this. I1 hat times omega1 dot plus, and here I have to look at the cheat sheet because I keep forgetting this myself, I3 minus I2, and then comes the two omegas with these two indices, two and three, and this is nothing else but the moment with respect to um, point B around the one axis, and the second one is I2 hat, omega 2 dot, plus, and here I think they flip, yes, I1 hat minus I3 hat times omega 1, omega 3, and this is the net torque about the two axis, and last not least we have I3 hat times omega 3 dot, plus, and here we have I2 hat minus I1 hat times omega 1, omega 2, and this is nothing else but the net torque about the three axes. And these over here are the famous Euler equations. And that's the main achievement of ours of this week. Now, a few comments that we have to be aware of here. These guys are torques with respect to point B about the three axes, but What's essential is that these guys are evaluated in the M-frame. So these over here are 
components of this network be evaluated in this m hat frame. So we need to make sure that we get the components in the right frame. Next, these i's that we see over here, these are nothing else but the diagonal values of my i tensor. We mentioned before that we're in the principal frame, which means our moment of inertia tensor now looks like that. i1 hat, i2 hat, i3 hat. And this is the moment of inertia tensor in the principal frame, right? So this is in the um, hat frame. And then we have the omegas in here, one comment about those. These are nothing else but the angular velocities of the body and of the frame, because they're the same. But the important point is, again, these guys are the components of my omega evaluated in the M frame. So if you have some general moment of uh, angular uh, velocity vector, always make sure to compose it in the components in this M frame. And here, of course, we're in the M hat frame. And then last but not least, when you have these components, we can also compute those guys here. And these, there are many different notations you can find in the notes on how to derive this. Please remember just the one thing. If you know these omegas, they are nothing else but their derivative. So omega i dot for each of these three is nothing else but the time derivative of the omega i from over here. So if you know the angular velocities, all you need to do is take one time derivative, and this gives you the omega dots over here. Okay? Now, these are the Euler equations which we can use, and what they give us is three equations for you know, rotations about the three axes. What's special as compared to previous cases are these terms here in the middle. Because usually we have i times phi double dot equals some torque. And we principle half that, if we consider this here as the angular acceleration, we have i times angular acceleration equals torque. And that looks as always, but we have these extra terms that come in. And that's because we're in a rotating frame. What are those? Well, think about it this way. When we look at LMB, and you're in a rotating frame, we see not only the real forces, but we also see inertial forces, Coriolis, Euler, centrifugal. These are extra terms that come in as inertial or fictitious apparent forces because we're on the rotating frame. And here it's exactly the same business. We are in a rotating reference frame where these forces exist, but whenever there are forces, these forces can produce torques. And so the Euler, centrifugal, and Coriolis forces can all produce torques on the system. And that's exactly what these two extra terms are in a nutshell. We've seen examples in class um, where these come in. Now we can actually interpret the extra terms as coming from, for example, uh, Coriolis or centrifugal forces. If you use these equations, we don't have to worry about that. All we need are the three torque components in the moving frame, the angular velocity in the moving frame, the moment of inertia tensor components in that moving frame, and the omega dots. And if you have those, we plug it in, and there's no need to worry about real or inertial forces or whatnot. We just use these equations. Now, note one thing. Sometimes it is convenient to not use the body frame, especially if we're in an axis symmetric body. For example, one that is rotational symmetric. Right? If you have a circle, circular cross-section, and you're rotating about this axis, you could pick an axis that looks like this, or you could pick a coordinate system, or you could pick one that rotates with the body. What's special is because this is axisymmetric, which means no matter which of the two ones you use, the cross-section always looks the same to you. It doesn't change as a function of angle, which means that we're still in the principal frame, no matter how far and how we rotate, we're always in the principal frame. The only difference, if we choose the green one here, is that we're still in the principal frame, but if we choose this green thing over here, then our omega m is not necessarily the same as the omega of the body. So if the omega, the body is spinning, right, the body is spinning with omega, and your frame is spinning with omega m, these two may not necessarily be the same. And in this particular case, we cannot use the Euler equations, but we can use the equation that led to the Euler equations. And the only difference between this guy up here and these equations down here is that here, we had to sneak in that capital omega as little omega. This, for the axisymmetric system, I'm talking about simplified into the first term. So this over here becomes this column. And this over here is what becomes that column over here. And so the only difference, if you have to do it with a frame where 
capital omega m, the frame of the rotating coordinate system, is not the same as the body, we need to replace this one, which means here we're not going to have two little omegas, but we're going to have one little omega and one capital omega. If you need that, just take a look at the formula collection or the lecture notes where it's explained quite neatly what the equations look like in both cases. I don't want to write them down here in full glory. Okay? So as a last comment, where do we need this and why do we need it? Well, we need it typically when a body is rotating, but not about the principal axis. So, for example, when we're rotating, but not about a principal axis. And the one example we showed in class was the cylinder that looks something like this. Imagine this is a cylinder with a circular cross-section, right? It has an axis of symmetry here. So we could easily draw, for example, a principal frame E1M, E2M, E3M out of the board. Now this is a principal frame for a cylinder. Now, if you rotate about this axis, fantastic, you know, principal frame, you're done. But what if the thing, you know, is supported like this, and now you're rotating about this axis? Let's imagine this is how you're rotating. And that's exactly one of the scenarios we discussed in class. Or the other case we can think about is spinning tops, which we we'll also talk about. So I'm bad at drawing, but imagine that this, you know, was a spinning top, in Kegel. And what happens here is, it stands on the ground, but you know this point undergoes a circular motion while also spinning about its own axis. This is axisymmetric, so in this case, of course, we could easily say it's axisymmetric, it's spinning about its axis, so why not introduce a coordinate system here, E1m, E2m, E3m, you know, perpendicular to that, and that makes things easy, but again, this thing is not only spinning about its own axis, but it's also rotating about the central axis. It's undergoing complicated motion, going on a circular motion, plus spinning, plus possibly wobbling up and down. That's what we call nutation. And so in all of these cases, it's easy to find the principal axis, but we're just not rotating about these principal axes, right? In this case, it's even more complicated than there, because there's some rotation component about that axis, there's some rotation component about that axis. If we choose this as our reference frame, we can easily do that because we align with the principal axis. And if we're rotating with a body, this could be a body frame. We could do the same thing here if we're actually spinning and rotating with a body. But these are rotating reference frames. They're moving. This is not standing still, and that's why we need the Euler equations. Let me just close with one quick remark, because we did discuss one special case. And this special case is what happens if you have something like this that spins very fast. So if something is fast spinning and axisymmetric, wheels, spinning tops, all these kind of things, then what we concluded for those was we can use what we call the TSP rule. And this means that what we call the precession rate cross the spin rate, both being vectors of angular velocity, equals approximately the applied torque divided by the moment of inertia I3 about the spin axis. This is the key equation. I think my pen is giving up soon. Uh, and this is what we know as the TSP rule. What we need for this is, okay, this is the torque that produces the motion, the precession of the object. This over here is nothing else but the spin. So in this particular example, it's nothing else but the spinning of the object about its own axis. So the spin around this axis is what we call C dot. And this phi dot is what we call the precession. For a steady precession, what this means is that we're also undergoing a rotation with the whole object about this axis over here. And this denotes my phi dot, so the rotation about this guy. And what this equation tells me is that if I take this precession phi dot, I cross it into the spin rate, C dot, then the cross part of those, which in this case comes out of the plane, goes towards you. This must be indicating the net torque with some normalization constant that comes from the moment of inertia. And this we can interpret physically because what 
actually causes the precession here. Precession, cross spin, equals torque. The torque comes out of the plane, which means it must be a torque that somehow tries to drag this thing down. And this is exactly what gravity is doing here. So the gravitational force is dragging us down. So for example, with respect to point O down here, which is fixed on the ground, this thing produces a torque, and this is why if you try to spin it, it's not going to stand still, but it's going to proceed. It's going to do the circular dance. If you want to spin the other way around, you must still satisfy that equation. The only way for this to work with the same torque is you must also change the orientation of your phi dot. And then minus and minus gives the same again, which means if you spin it the other way around, it's not going to do the same dance, but it's going to dance in the opposite direction. That's a consequence of the TSP rule. So this is the spin. That's what we call the precession. And so whenever from now on you see something spinning fast, we don't necessarily have to use the full-blown glorious Euler equations, but we can use the TSP rule. And that's very often quite handy if you just want to figure out, you know, what direction is the torque, uh, is, uh, is the torque acting onto a rotating system. And that's pretty much it for week nine. We've uh, arrived more or less at the end of our rotating non-inertial frame discussions. And uh, we have plenty of nice examples uh, in the exercises on rotating frames and A and B in those. Thanks and ciao.